All right, everybody, welcome to The Cult of Honesty for October 30th, 2013. I have with me Alex Greco, I have Jonathan, as well as Ozzy. Uh, I am Christopher Matty. I'm going to be your host for this evening, and we are going to cover a couple different topics um, to have you uh, chew on with us as we explore them. Now, um, we were talking right before we started getting on air um, about the things that we are going to present to you. And uh, if you are interested, please, um, either if you're watching on Ustream, please comment in the comment section on Ustream. If you are watching on the um, Kion Diathake YouTube channel, YouTube, um, please comment in the comment section and join the conversation. And we will try to incorporate the viewer comments as much as humanly possible. Now, we were talking about faith. We are four atheists talking about faith. Ozzy had some opinions about people whose worldview lacks faith. People who call themselves epistivists. But we're going to hold on to that thought for just one moment. Is there anybody here who has opinions about faith in general? Personal opinions about when people ask them if they have faith in anything, because we're all what we people would call non-believers, atheists, agnostics, all of the above. Well, no, I certainly do. Yeah, no, I certainly do. Go um, ahead. Uh, well, the, the word faith has to be unpacked because there's various um, understandings of that word. Um, I mean, in ordinary discourse, of faith, I mean, that is outside of religious discourse. Um, we can talk about um, faith simply in terms of trust or confidence in something. So, I mean, I have all kinds of faith in all sorts of propositions. You know, I have faith that my car is not going to break down, um, which is not to say that I think that it couldn't happen, but that, I mean, if I thought my car was going to break down, I wouldn't I wouldn't get behind the wheel and go for a long drive. So I have faith in, in all kinds of things. Like, I mean, I couldn't get up in the morning without some degree of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but that's understood that that's a kind of warranted faith, that I, there's all kinds of evidence in support of that. And so... You know, it's it's a mile away from what might one might term blind faith. Um, and very often, when people are objecting to the concept of faith, they're objecting to what they regard as a concept of blind faith. That someone has taken some huge leap of faith. Um, that is, someone is believing in something um, without evidence, or either entirely without evidence, or without sufficient evidence. Or I think what happens most of the time is not that people believe entirely without evidence or without reasons but the confidence in what they're believing in so outstrips what the evidence they have warrants that there's there's a mismatch between their confidence in what they believe, the conviction that they feel, and any possible evidence that they can marshal and, and bring forth in support of what they believe. And um, I think that this facilitates a certain kind of shell game um, when certain apologists utilize the word faith when they're talking to people of non-belief and I've talked about this before and that shell game has to do with something like this um, do you have faith? Well, well yes I have faith I have faith in the same way that you Ozzy just described faith as being um, having to do with trust right and then all of a sudden they equate the faith that I'm talking about which has to do with trust as equaling blind faith or leap of faith, which is now a religious connotation, and then label me as having a faith-based worldview. Mm -hmm. So that's very diff that's very clever, and that works great in a colloquial context. And it's very difficult to avoid or get out of when you're trapped in it. But I think that it's um, it's more of a carnival barker trick than it is an intellectually honest display of having shown anything. Has anybody, has anybody gotten into that um, conundrum themselves? I've certainly been on the receiving end of that, yeah. Yeah. I think I heard something from you, Jonathan. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've dealt with that a little bit. I, um, my family is, is, is quite religious, um, and... Uh, it's it's something that I come across not only from them but also from from fam, uh, friends who are also uh, uh, religious, um, and you get you get the uh, the misrepresentation from people that uh, 
that atheism in itself is also a, a faith-based uh, belief. It's it's a religion. Um, it's it's unnerving. I don't I, I don't like um, combating that uh, that position particularly just because it's it, it almost seems like it's uh, it's an attempt to to get you into a a pointless squabble with them. It's 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 almost a non-issue to me. Um, but I, I I I I think I kind of agree with with what Ozzy was saying there that it's it's okay to say that you have faith in in certain things. It depends on on what the meaning of the word is when you're using it. And our language has this lovely thing where they they have so many meanings to uh, just to one word. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I, I actually I taught English uh, in in China about ten years ago, and uh, that was one of the hurdles that we had. As well, I'd, I'd be standing in front of uh, students, and and uh, I would I would drop a word, and and they would have this confused look on their face, and um, it's it's difficult. But you, what makes it even more difficult is is when you're talking with somebody uh, like a Sai Tin Bruggenkate or an Eric Coven, um and they'll they'll employ the use of, of one word a, a, in a certain manner, and then in later on down down the down the road in the same sentence even they'll use it in a completely different way. Yes. Um. So I I, I would agree there where you would want a definition of how they actually mean the word before before getting into it. But like I said, it's not it's not something that I'm eager to to defend against. I, well, I don't. I, oh, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that um, you know we've characterized it as a as a shell game, and um, that makes it sounds like like it's very deliberate um, that it's an attempt at uh, deception, and I think that's not quite what's going on there. I I think that um, I mean as Jonathan uh, rightly said, there, there's there's equivocation going on here. Um, that is uh, one word being used in two different senses. Um, uh, but I think people come by that rather honestly. They they don't realize that they're making that mistake. Um, you know, we see the same thing in in the discourse over evolution and creation. You know, oh, evolution is just a theory. Well, I mean, there are two senses of the word theory. There's the sort of the vernacular common use of the word theory, which means something like some lower order hypothesis. You know, certainly nothing like a fact. And then there's the the use of the word theory in a more restricted scientific sense, which is a much more honorific term. Something reserved for you know something sort of at, at the top of uh, the uh, the epistemological uh, scale of uh, of confidence, uh, and I think that's what happens with uh, with faith is you've got these two senses, but they're not entirely unrelated, and there's some overlap between them, and so people move from one to the other quite quite naturally without trying to play uh, a game, without trying to deceive. Now I think some people have had that that. Uh, this, the distinction uh, between those two senses of the word faith pointed out to them, and then nevertheless exploit the ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're just stalling. You know, they just <laughs> they'll just run this this, uh, this this move by you, even though you've heard it before and they've heard it before, and you both know that you you all heard it before, uh, and it eats up a little bit of time. Um, but I mean, I think most people in ordinary discourse, when they when they present this, when they trot this out, it just seems to make sense to them. Uh, now, I, I'm going to muddy the waters a little bit, if I may. Please. Um, uh, I, there's a certain sense in, in which I think we all are, uh, we all take things on on faith, um, in something close to blind faith. Um, there's all kinds of things that I happen to believe that I couldn't possibly justify. Um, uh, you know, philosophically, scientifically, there's just there's there's really no rational way to defend them. Um, the, the one that comes to mind is uh, most readily is the the idea of um, uh, a mind-independent reality, the idea that there's a, an actual world out there, that it's not all just happening in my mind or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's nothing to suggest, there's nothing uh, around me to suggest that everything is happening in my mind, but, but everything that is going on around me is compatible with it being some kind of hallucination um, going on entirely in my mind. Uh, so the idea that there's a world outside of, my, outside of me uh, is something that I can't, I can't demonstrate that because every fact I could point to would be consistent with it happening in my mind. Similarly, so, the idea that so there are other minds... So you're saying that basal assumptions are the same thing as faith? 
Well, we take them on faith. I mean, certain things that we would we, we would think of as properly basic beliefs, the belief that there's a mind-independent reality, the belief that other people out there exist, are real, and that they too have minds, subjective mental experiences that we can't directly experience ourselves. Um, uh, the idea, um, oh, <laughs> belief in induction, just the idea that the future will resemble the past in relevant respects, that, that um, you know, that, that an assumption that nature is fairly uniform and that the established regularities that we have experienced will persist and continue to hold in the future. That's, that's not something that, that you can justify based on prior experience except by arguing in a circle. Um, and to the extent that we want to be rational and say that arguing in a circle is not a valid form of argument, then that's, that's something that I can't justify uh, it sounds rationally. sounds like you're talking about pattern detection and just viewing it through the lens of belief and faith. Um, Oh, you mean with respect, to, with, with respect to what I said about induction? Yes. Uh, no, no, it's a little different than that. I mean, sh sure, there's pattern detection going on, but um, I mean, we have a capacity, and I think it's an innate ca capacity for pattern detection. I think all organisms have it. Without it, they couldn't, they couldn't model or represent reality and, and behave and respond accordingly to what's to changes in their their immediate environments and circumstances. Um, no, but what I mean is, um, this is just Hume's problem of induction. Uh, Hume was a, a, a British philosopher, um, and uh, he, he he first pointed out that there's a problem with this idea of induction. Uh, induction as opposed to deduction. Uh, deduction is just the idea that you, you look at particular instances of something, and then you, you, you generate a general rule about it. You know, you see a, a black crow, you see another black crow, eventually you formulate the position that all, clo all crows are black. Um, but the problem with uh, induction is that how to, how to justify induction itself. I mean, if you assume induction works, great, you can have all of science and you can do all this wonderful stuff. But the question is, what happens if someone were to call into question uh, induction itself, the, the very use of induction? Is induction a legitimate form of argument? Are we being rational when we use induction? That's a little trickier because as soon as a person says, well, I know that induction works because well, I've used induction my whole life, and it's always worked. Well, now you've just used induction to justify induction. Mm -hmm. That is clearly a circular argument. It's manifestly so. The thing is, we all do it all the time, and so ingrained in us, it seems perverse to deny that induction works. You couldn't get up in the morning. Uh, you wouldn't know that you could get up in the morning without, a, without using induction. Um, so there, there's a, there, this is called the, the Hume's problem of induction. It's the problem of how to justify induction. Okay. Uh, you can't use induction because that would be circular, but there's no deductive way of justifying induction either. I mean, philosophers and logicians have been trying literally for centuries now uh, since uh, Hume first identified this problem. So induction, the problem of other minds, the notion that there's a mind-independent reality, these are all things that I take quite literally as articles of faith. Uh, they are, in, in my understanding, properly basic beliefs. Uh, we, you can only question them on, on pain of, of doing complete you know, devastation to your, your, your entire outlook on reality. Uh, these are things that we all share in common. We all assume these things. We all take them for granted. In such, as, as such, we take them on faith. So I'm not afraid of the word faith. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what, what bothers me about faith is when people want to go beyond those things that we all have to take um, on faith, or all do seem to take on faith, um, and then ask me to take even more things on faith. Well, then it gets a little harder to swallow. Um, but I don't think we need to run away from the word faith. Can I ask a question here? Is that Jonathan? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, brother. Um, is there what in in everything that you just described there? Is there a difference between the faith that you just talked about and the faith that a believer would have in in their God? Excuse me, in their in their particular God. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. It's it's hard to uh, to differentiate it actually. Um, I mean, I would, I would very much like to be able to say, no, 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 no. These faith-based claims that I, that I hold to, um, are, are of a different sort. They're completely different. Um, well, I would say that epistemically speaking, they're not different. Um, and, but they're, they're, they are different in one respect from more regular faith-based claims of, of religion, and that is that we all share these, and uh, we can't get by without them. Whereas one can certainly get by without religious the the articles of religious faith, and I mean, many of us do get by without them. So clearly, we don't need them. Um, and and if anyone says, no, no, you absolutely have to have these these other uh, 
kinds of faith-based claims, the, the religious ones. You just have to point to someone who doesn't have them of another religion, who has competing or, and conflicting ones. Well, they can't both be right, so it can't be the case that you have to have these. You only have to look around yourself at the other religious people, right? And if someone wants to sort of sort of back away from the specifics of their religion and say, well, no, you have to believe in some God, at least, if you want to sort of do what, uh, what presuppositionalists do, for instance. They say, well, you've got to believe in some, some God. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the Christian God. Um, you know, Muslims can, can use the same apologetic. Um, you can point then to people who don't believe in a God at all and see that, no, they manage to get up in the morning and go about their business. So there are some faith-based assertions that I think that we all share, and we don't have to be embarrassed about them. It would be great if we could somehow support them, but we don't know how. Um, uh, and, I mean, that is, there's no way to do it that isn't somehow circular. Uh, but that, that's not a license to believe any, anything and everything on faith. I like the way that you embrace, um, you embrace the term faith. I think that you and I are on the same page and we're using different language in the sense that there are certain epistemic dilemmas that I just accept. I accept that there are certain circular reasoning that we have to engage in. I accept that, um, like if you're going to talk about presuppositionalism, <clears throat> um, and I don't want to really focus on presuppositionalism to be honest, but they uh, they talk about vicious circularity, where you know your senses and reason and memory um, uh, justify your senses, reason, and memory. I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm okay with that epistemic dilemma, the fact that um, my senses, memory, and reason corroborate my senses, memory, and reason, or I have to rely on somebody else's senses, memory, and reason to corroborate what I'm seeing, touching, feeling, reasoning, or remembering. Um, I, and instead of that being vicious to me, which is an arbitrary label in my opinion, vicious versus virtuous, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just accept it. So I guess in your terms, I'm taking it on faith that, yep, that's what humans do. People are still trying to f figure it out, philosophers, and, you know, in the field of uh, epistemology, they haven't figured it out. I'll throw my hat in with them. I don't have it figured out. Let's move on and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> I, 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 I dis I'd tweak that a little bit. I, I'd, Go. First of all, the distinction between virtuous... Circle, circularity and vicious circularity is, is I think, a, a non-starter. It has no currency in philosophy and epistemology. I mean, uh, uh, all circles, all circular reasoning is vicious, and what we mean by vicious is simply that it's it's invalid. You, you cannot simply um, argue in a circle. When you argue in a circle, you haven't supported your claims. So you're either supporting your claims, which is right, in which case you're not arguing in a circle, or you or you are arguing in a circle, in which case you haven't supported your argument. So they're all they're all vicious. They're all there, there's no virtuous circles. That that is sort of a uh, a, a, a kind of self congratulation, you know, of, of, of bad reasoning. Um, Here's so where you want to curse. <laughs> yeah, it's a white uh, lie. <laughs> uh, but I mean, the 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 important thing for me is that look, sure we take th some things on faith. Um, I mean, deep things on faith, the, in the sure. very deepest things on faith, the the biggest things on faith. You know that there's a Mind independent reality that there are other minds that there's such a the concept of truth that you know all kinds of things we take on faith um, the um, but these are I, I would term properly basic beliefs these are beliefs that you simply cannot dispense with um, uh, when you try to dispense with them terrible things happen to you and I don't mean that oh well there's a sort of pragmatic consideration here you know like you know you better believe these things or else something will, bad will happen to you that, that mm -hmm. doesn't right uh, I I just mean that your your worldview would be a completely different uh, worldview and possibly um, and an ineffectual one <laughs> one, you, one that wouldn't work for you at all um, that might lead to a very quick demise well I'd uh, like to I'd like to interrupt just for a second and bring sure. Alex into the conversation Alex oh, what do you yeah. have faith in um, actually, I was going really small with this one, with this topic. I was going with, but um, yeah, I, 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 it goes without at least saying for me that there are things that we have no choice but to have faith in. It, it, um, I just, I guess, I'm interested on why uh, the things that I have faith in are different than, let's say, when somebody you know has faith in, and I'm trying to figure that out in my head, like. I, w I wanted to understand you said, um, Ozzy, that you take things on faith that you have to. Some um, I wanted to know how you justify 
uh, the I forgot which what word you used, but you said practical basal assumptions. You said there was a specific type of assumptions that you said that. Um, I'm not sure what term I, I used there. It was with a P. Oh, um, pro properly basic belief. Proper, properly basic belief. Exactly. I wanted to know how you how you um, how you were justifying that. What what differentiates a, a properly based belief with something that's you know out to lunch? You also said earlier that um, uh, I already take a lot of things on faith, and I'm not going to add you know an additional amount to it. And I'm curious to to um, to yeah, understand I, more what you meant about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we want to demarcate uh, beliefs that, that I think are genuinely properly basic from um, ones that one is just going to declare to be properly basic. Um, Alvin Plantinga, famously, is, is someone who uses the expression properly basic belief um, and um, has written quite a lot about it, actually. Um, and he's a philosopher, for those who don't know who he is. He's an analytic philosopher. Um, and uh, He's one who thinks that belief in God is properly basic, and I would say, well, no, no, hold on, buddy, it's not properly basic. And the proof that it's not properly basic is that there are people who don't believe in God and, and literally don't believe in God and manage to get by. Now, he's of the sort of reformed, uh, sort of Calvinistic. Uh, I don't know that he's Calvinist, but it's reformed anyway, Christian faith, and and they affirm that everyone ultimately believes in faith, and that those who deny that they they believe in believe in God, that is, those who deny that they believe in God are actually Basically, either self-deluded or yeah. simply lying. So, but um, there's nothing much you can do when people just simply tell you what you you in fact believe, contrary to what you think you believe. Um, so, uh, uh, notwithstanding that objection, um, there are people out there who manage to get by without a belief in God. So, the concept of properly basic belief shouldn't be construed as a license to believe any old thing by declaring it properly basic. So wh wh what, what, why am I including the things under the heading of properly basic that I'm including? Well, notice that there are things that um, that I, I really can't do without. I mean, um, I can't justify the use of deduction. Okay, think of a rule, of a simple rule of inference like um, uh, modus ponens, the rule of inference that says if A implies B and A is true, therefore B is true. That's called modus ponens. It, it's, it's a Latin word for an inference rule. It means it means the way I think. Um, I don't know how not to use modus ponens. Um, I, I can't get as far as, as justifying modus ponens without using modus ponens, <laughs> right? Um, so the reason that I trust in, in, in logic uh, and use logic is not because I have a way of justifying and defending logic. And the only way I could do that is if I were to use logic and I'd be involved in a circular mm -hmm. argument and that would be completely fruitless. No, the reason, so why do I use logic? I, logic is just what we use that, uh, that allows us to make inferences that preserve truth, that, that are, would, we, they preserve consistency and truth. Um, and I don't want to get all technical on, about formal logic here, but um, that's that's why we uh, we trust in logic, and the reason we trust in induction isn't that we have a way of justifying induction. Um, it's that we're the kinds of organisms that use induction. Other organisms use induction. You know, my dog uses induction. You know, your your cat hears you turn on the electric can opener and opening a, a can of, of of cat food, and your cat comes running. Your cat's using induction. Uh, your cat doesn't have to go through a, the big process of, of cogitation to figure out that there's cat food there. I mean, it's very instinctual. Um, and so being animals, we use induction as well. Uh, now, the problem is if you were to say, well, I'm today I'm going to stop using induction. I'm going to stop basing all of my actions and beliefs on the assumption that there are regularities in nature and that the future is going to resemble the past in relevant respects. I'm going to stop assuming that. What are you going to do next? You know, mm -hmm. right? you know. Supposing you get you feel a hunger pang and you get hungry, you're not. If, if you were to abandon induction, you wouldn't even be able to say, "Well, I better go eat something," because of course, your the assumption that eating something is going to satisfy your hunger is based on experiences that in the past, when you got hungry, filling your face got rid of the hunger pangs. So you wouldn't be able to do that. You wouldn't be able to motivate yourself to literally, you wouldn't be able to motivate yourself to go eat. You wouldn't be able to say, you know, I'm uncomfortable sitting here. I've been in the same position for too long. Maybe I should shift, right? Uh, it, it, it would either happen, have to happen automatically without you thinking about it. You could never come to the conclusion that you should change position. If, uh, if I didn't like something that I was looking at, 
you know, it, it wouldn't occur to me to turn my head and look at something else. Um, so, uh, you, but there's you, no, yeah, you just, there's no way to abandon that. Well, I mean, see, the idea is you might say, well, how do you know? Like, an objection would be, well, wait, how do you know that you can't abandon that, right? And you, 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 the only way that you could sort of, you might argue, would be tempted to argue would be to say, well, if I were to abandon induction, disaster would follow, right? Uh, well, you don't know that disaster would follow. What are you doing? You're using induction, induction. and considering, right? So that you're arguing in a circle again, right? So, you, you but you can be wrong about that. Yeah. Well, of course you could be. For all you know, reality is going to change. The whole the whole objection of uh, of the argument against uh, induction is uh, that, or the problem of induction uh, of justifying induction is that we are all like Russell's hens. Um, Bertrand Russell gave this example of hens in a in a in a hen house in a, in a farmyard. And every day the farmer comes and they go greet him because he throws you know food down on the ground and they peck and they're very satisfied and happy to see him every day and then one day he shows up and they all come running out and they're all happy to see him and he grabs a whole bunch of them rings their neck and and, and chops their heads off and cooks them up you know we the, the future could change at any moment we, do, we simply don't know that the sun is going to rise tomorrow um, uh, and we don't know that the laws of physics are going to hold we, we, we assume we take it on faith that they're going to hold why because they've held in the past we assume that regularities of that have been established will continue to persist in the future. There's no guarantee of that. There's no logical argument you can pre present that's going to guarantee that the, that the future will resemble the past in relevant respects. Now, the way that I, I, I sort of, I, I don't solve the problem, uh, Hume's problem of induction, but, um, and that's why it's an article of faith for me, but the reason I think it's a properly basic belief is that I could not motivate any particular course of action without assuming and using induction. I couldn't, supposing I, I said, hmm, um, you know, I'm tra trapped in a room, I got to get out of here. Oh, look, there's a door. Maybe I should open the door and walk out of here. If I didn't use induction, I would be stuck in a room. I would literally not be able to get out of a room, right? I, I could motivate no action. I couldn't even say to myself, maybe I should think harder on this and try to reason my way out of this problem. I wouldn't know that reasoning is going to work for me because, you know, that's based on induction. Um, so, it's properly basic in the sense that my every action, my every thought is predicated on the assumption that induction um, is, is reliable. Without that, I can't do anything. That's why it's properly basic. But that you can't say that about certain other beliefs, like the belief in God. As, I mean, there was a time when I believed in God, and that, that informed so much of my thinking, my moral thinking, um, my, 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 what I valued in life. Uh, the kinds of uh, actions I would undertake, what I thought was a noble uh, pursuit, it, it infected so much of my thinking that it was at the time I thought, "Geez, I can't go without this 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 belief." And when I started losing my faith, I might, you know, I sort of felt this huge um, lack of uh, of equilibrium. Um, but I got over that, as everyone gets over it who eventually loses their faith, and they discover, "Oh, I was mistaken." You can get by without this. This was not a properly basic belief. I thought it was. I, so that, I think that's how I demarcate it. Does that answer your question? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, because I put a comment on the side because as you were you were, you were uh, closing to the end, it just went. Oh, there we go. So yeah, I, I, that answered my question um, perfectly. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, the reason the reason I guess I brought it up. I'm I'm not I'm not um, terribly big on on. Uh, philosophy and and those arguments, you know, really, really uh, are are a little bit more difficult for me. But I'm um, very interested in human behavior and why humans uh, got to a point where they had faith in things that weren't uh, things that. Well, yeah, well, just faith in the wacky. Well, is it because? Um, is it because of false associations that people have made? Uh, they attributed, you know, events like the, the, uh, events improperly to the mind they associated to some kind of supernatural force. Um, that that that's where where why would people have gone to applying to um, applying faith not to practical uh, induction, let's say, but for supernatural? Why did we go there? We're built for superstitious behavior. <clears throat> that, are, uh, yeah. We are built to. Um, we are built to think that correlation does mean causation, and that's why we need something rigorous like the scientific method to tease 
out the fact that correlation does not mean causation. That's why we need firewalls against our cognitive biases and heuristics, those mental shortcuts that um, lead our mundane thinking into illogical and irrational um, conclusions. Do you think that those habits that we've made um, using like agenticity or, or uh, let's say correlation and causation, do you think that we became, we made habits of getting, let's say, a reaction from that? And then we figured, oh, this must be something. This must be working. And then we continue down that cycle and it just reinforced. Um, Every once in a while, it's right. Right? And that's all you need. Okay. To, to, to keep that as a technique. Every once in a while. Well, no, you know, wait. It, every once in a while, it's right, and we keep it. Every, if, every every once in a while, correlation does mean causation. Okay. So when things are timed together, sometimes they, the the two things, one thing does cause the second thing. So if I pray to you to get healed, for example, and I don't know, a scab falls off, and there's no scar, or, or whatever the case is, it's or if a you terrible, pray for terrible rain. example. If it's if it's a drought and you pray for rain. Maybe it happened enough times in a desperate situation, or it happened, you know, um, it happened enough times before it rained that you finally thought, yes, we finally prayed hard enough, and that's why it finally did rain. Okay. It's like the phenomenon of, um, hey, I couldn't find my keys, and they were in the last place I looked, obviously. Well, of course, because once you found them, you stopped looking. <laughs> So they're always in the last place that you look. So it's like that weird mental phenomenon where it's like, oh, okay. Well, it's like baseball players and, and their lucky Socks. whatever article of clothing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, it's no because of the rarity of, you know, getting, I don't know sports, the, the, with the thing. So when like it's so rare, it's much more <laughs> rare for a batter to hit the ball than a catcher, right? Is that it? To catch the ball? <laughs> I'm terrible. But um, that when it does happen, or they do hit a home run, for example, um, and they did something right before, they'll associate it uh, to, let's say, you know, I was wearing my socks that day, or I was doing this, and, and they'll just continue with that pattern, and because they, they've associated. That's associative uh, learning. That's superstitious behavior. But the fact that this, because of the statistics being or the odds being much uh, higher, that it reinforces it, you know, this is much more. Like the placebo effect. Yes. Yes. So that, that, that goes into a different version of faith. <laughs> okay, let's talk about if that. You get, if you get, um, the amazing thing about the placebo effect is that even if you know it's a placebo, it still works. Sometimes. And to a lesser degree, it, it, it works. To a lesser degree, but it's something if, like I can't remember what the number was. It, it was either thirty or seventy percent. The last thing I read on the subject that you 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 still obtain seventy percent, or or maybe it was thirty percent. I can't remember now of of the effect, even when you know when you are told you are in the placebo group. They've yeah. actually done those experiments. Well, I think that the, the placebo effect is a testament to the benefit of faith. I think that it. Mm. I think that uh, it, depending on how you frame it, it can be used as a powerful argument to the fact that faith is a good thing, uh, and I think that it can be used as an argument for like you know let's not go over the top with the things that you have faith in. You know let's let's let you know allopathic medicine do what it's supposed to, and let alternative medicine be an alternative to allopathic medicine, and let's not let the placebo effect alter what we understand as mainstream versus. Um, alternative, you know, alternative being the operative term here, um, but, you know, um, having faith in certain things happening increases the efficacy of, of the treatment. And, and, yeah, it's, and that it's would been, be an interesting show in and of itself. That, oh yeah, that would, that would be an easy 60 minutes right there. Yeah, I wouldn't even be inclined to, de to, dis to, to deny that, that faith brings with it all kinds of benefits. Um, I mean, the placebo effect is just one illustration of that, uh, where the person doesn't even know that they have faith, right? I mean, someone hands you a pill, and somehow this represents, it, it's like the sum total of, of, of human medical knowledge is, is, is concentrated in this thing, and you're eating this sugar bullet, and it, and it has an effect on you. I mean, it would not surprise me at all that, that would, if, there were, if it were shown that 
uh, believing in a god or you know prayer and other things brought with it um, some benefits. I mean, th th these, this would have to be shown, you know, under what circumstances and to what degree. But it, I, I would find it very unsurprising. But it taps into the mind-body duality to a certain extent, in in such a way that uh, you know science still doesn't have its uh, head wrapped around. Yeah, I find it interesting that despite having known about the the uh, the placebo effect for so long and it being so well studied, we still don't have a good grip on on what what the mechanism is by which this happens. And I don't even know that we know what what the relevant variables are uh, in this. I, and I know there's been a lot of experimental work on it. But it's not something I've kept on, up on. I started an undergraduate degree in psychology many many years ago, but I, I quit after a while. But and mm -hmm. went into something else. But uh, at the time, I mean, it was very much un, undis, undetermined what uh, what what the variables were. Were you trying to say something there, Jonathan? Oh, uh, sorry. I was just saying. Uh, I, I suspect that the answer will probably come out of neuroscience. Yeah, presumably. Yeah. Well, they they attribute it to the power of the mind, right? So, uh, I I think they're of the assumption that how our minds work that we have uh, locked in there somewhere the capability of controlling our body to a greater degree than what we're already aware of. Yeah, I don't know that it implies control, but it implies that that when you think uh, you're receiving a treatment, some, some something in, in you that is perhaps entirely without outside your control or possibly potentially within your control um, uh, is uh, can 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 take hold and and literally heal you um, and confer some some benefits. So, do you think that we can do a, a controlled study, a double blind control study, where uh, we have theists and atheists taking a placebo and we tell them <laughs> that it makes them more civil and respectful, uh, or it and, changes and their por their position? See if it changes their position immediately. <laughs> No, I think that I, I wanted to take the last little, um, we have about 20 minutes left. I wanted to take the last little bit of the conversation that we're going to be airing tonight and, uh, and talk about something that's a little bit related to this because it has to do with faith. Uh, how much faith and trust do you have in the person that you're talking to? And how much does that influence how you would judge the criteria of what a civil and respectful discourse is in talking about something as sensitive as the topics in the atheist theist landscape. This is something that um, Ozzy had brought up. So um, I'll throw it out there. What determines, you know, what constitutes civil and respectful discourse when you're talking um, in the unfaithful or the uh, interfaith dialogue when you're talking to somebody that is of a theist, somebody that is of faith? How do, how do you set those rules from the get-go? How do you prevent it from getting too passionate? How do you get to talking about things that you uh, disagree about without being disagreeable? Go. I'm Canadian. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so am Please. I. It just we we're, we just always uh -huh. civil. It it. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> not always civil. Look at a hockey game. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean that. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> no, but we have to we have to be able to figure out where the rules are. We have to be able to um, de determine how to set those rules so that when we have conversations with people, we can have a, a, a gentleman's agreement or a gentle person's agreement or a civil um, social contract that everybody can agree agree on, and be we can invite people to, so that everything that's said from that point forward, everyone understands what's going on. This is a but, tough one. <laughs> this is something that I would uh, I would actually uh, say that the New Covenant group actually does quite well. Uh, the way that you have theists and atheists on there, and they're all talking together, and nobody's nobody's chewing each other's head off or anything. And you guys come together actually very well and, and talk about things that we as human beings uh, all, all have to deal with. You know, wh whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, we're all in this world together. And so that that. I guess in a way creates a foundation that you can start on. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Jonathan. Is there anything that you could see us doing any better? We're always looking for improvement. Oh, uh, uh, I perhaps a uh, I, I don't know, like a, a, a ticker at the bottom of the screen um, that when when somebody on there uh, drops a word that 
a person out there probably doesn't understand <laughs> that there's a definition following. Uh, it's a bit of a time saver, uh, time saver, I would say. You know that Dr. Jones? He knows those long <laughs> words. Yes. When I heard indexical and dictic elements, I my brain <laughs> a little bit. I knew what he meant by those, here. but when he said objad, I was like, wait a minute, I don't know that one. Where <laughs> that sent me running for the dictionary. I had to look that up too. I didn't know how to spell it, which was even the worst part. Oh, I had a hunch because I thought I'd seen it, but I didn't know what it meant. Your vocabulary will get much variegated after listening <laughs> to uh, Dr. Jones for a little while. I can um, guarantee it. Oh, but I, I think on a on a person to person level, I. I, I don't see that there's really much room for improvement other than perhaps uh, exploring ways to um, uh, spread the word, I guess, would be the way to put it, about about what you guys are actually up to and what you're doing. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know how you would do that, but... Um, oh, I hear you. Yeah, we, we very much want the word spread. So, you know, tell your friends is all I can say. Um, but, you know, keep 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 your eye on the, the New Covenant group. Um, I think that you're already... Um, on the Facebook page for those of you that are watching and or listening. Uh, if you're not hip to the, the Facebook page of the Cult of Honesty, please go to Facebook and join our group, the Cult of Honesty. There are great things happening for the Cult of Honesty slash New Covenant group. We are in the process of doing some post edits for the footage we got for uh, the John Shook experience, which was this past weekend. We're going to have some really tasty nuggets of uh, information from him um, that we're going to be um, putting together very soon. And um, Ozzy, I wanted to get some more information from you about this particular topic. What constitutes, because you're the one who brought this up in the, in the pregame show. Um, yeah. yeah, I was holding back because I, I felt I've had a little too much to say thus far. Um, no, we like hearing what you have to say. You articulate yourself well. Oh, thanks. I don't. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, well, the difficulty is that... Um, with religious topics, they can be extremely divisive. They can be extremely dis divisive because the stakes are so high. I mean, I'm an atheist. I think when we die, we're dead and we stay dead. And I can't think of any reason to think that there's anything going on beyond that. And I don't think that there's any uh, overarching plan for my life. I don't think the universe has a stake in my existence or anything like that. Um, so um, my actions have significance in this world to me and to, and to other people. And they might have lasting um, significance to to you know, people in the future, but they don't have any cosmic significance. But if you're a religious person, your your actions can have a different kind of significance. Um, and if you're someone who believes in heaven and hell, then you know you're, you're faced you know with with this, this problem that you know your actions are are, are potentially going to determine whether the best possible thing that can happen to anyone happens to you, or the worst possible thing that can happen to anyone is going to happen to you. Um, and this is why you, you, you know, we we sort of run into to problems with, uh, as atheists talking to religious people is they seem so intransigent, intransigent and, and, and recalcitrant. They seem to sort of want to give no quarter in, in, in some respects, and it's uh, because, of course, the stakes. As, as they see them, are extremely high. I mean, if you thought the stakes were that high, mm -hmm. you know, if you thought, you know, the person next door was a child molester, you know, you would not let your kid wander off into that next yard or anything like that. You'd be very alarmed. It would change a lot of things in your life and how you organize your life and, and the behavior of your children and, and such. Um, so, I mean, all you have to do is imagine that the stakes are a whole lot higher and then you can understand why people are so in your face and, and sort of knocking on your door on a Sunday morning and proselytizing and why they're standing in front of a church um, holding up signs uh, against abortion and stuff like that. I mean, just ask yourself, if you thought infants were being murdered somewhere, right, how would you respond? Would you do nothing? Presumably not if you're a conscientious person. Well, you know, so the, the stakes matter. And, and what ends up happening is because they think the stakes are so high, um, and we think the stakes are not high, mm -hmm. um, we run into problems. Now, w with civility, there's, a, there's another issue. They have this idea of sacredness that we t typically don't have. Now, some of us think that life is sacred, or we might have certain ideas about, you know, the environment is sacred or something like that. These are not views that I hold, but, I mean, I've known atheists who, had, who, had, who held all kinds of things as sacred. Or you may maybe think democracy is sacred. But for the religious person, 
sort of sacredness is sort of very often at the center of their of their outlook. There are certain subjects that are sacred, and you have to speak about them in a certain way. And mm -hmm. as soon as you start talking about them in a way that they deem to be profane, you're being rude. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you'll, they, they, they object a lot when we say, well, look, your God sounds to me like a moral monster, right? I mean, there's no more horrible thing you can, can say. As far as they're concerned, it, it, it's worse than saying your wife is ugly and your your children are stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, like, this is this is... You know, th that would be nothing compared to saying that your God is a moral monster, right? I mean, that is really the, you know, what they think is the, the best possible being, the, the being the most worthy perfect. of it. Uh, yeah, the, the, the thing most worthy of, 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 of flattery and, 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 and veneration and reverence is, is being called a monster, right? So there's, there's no polite way. There is no, in my view, there is no polite way to have honest discourse. I think that you can have honest discourse. Um, we, we, we don't want dishonest discourse. We want honest discourse. And that means you have to ruffle some feathers. You have to be prepared to be told, oh, you're a nihilist. You, you're, you're an atheist. You must be a nihilist. Mm -hmm. right? oh, yeah. You must be a moral relativist. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And they have to be prepared to hear things like, you're, you know, you're worshipping a book, and the, 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 the book describes a being that by, by my lights seems horrific, and you're picking and choosing you know, things out of the book, and you know, stuff like that. These are all going to be deeply offensive things. Um, now, some people are more thin-skinned than others, but I mean, you know, the more you take your beliefs seriously, the harder it is to be, to be civil. So I'm not too concerned about civil discourse. I think that if you can apply the principle of intellectual charity and you can try to be honest in the discussions, honest about what you believe, honest what you, what you think of them, and not set out to offend. That's the other thing. Then I think it, it, it can go. I mean, I've been in dialogue with people for years, uh, mostly on IRC, which is Internet Relay Chat, which is a live typed medium. Um, and, you know, it, you can really offend people easily that way and be offended easily that way because it's typed. You don't get the, the tone, the inflection. You can't, you, it's off. You, easy to misread what a person's thinking and saying and what they mean when they say something. But I've been in dialogue with some people for years and managed to have productive conversations. I've had many more unproductive conversations and insulting ones back and forth. Um, but I, I think if you try to be honest and you apply the principle of intellectual charity, which says assume that the person on the other side, your opponent or the, whoever you're having a discussion with, is at least as intelligent as you and at least as knowledgeable as you. Now, sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, and w but as you discover that, oh, well, maybe they don't know this much about this subject or maybe, they're not, maybe they're, they don't know certain principles of skeptical reasoning and critical thinking, you know, that's when you take opportunities to explain things. But if you end up doing, this is sort of coming out of a discussion I had with Jonathan, actually. Um, if you sort of use opportunities when a person screws up and says something wrong as a gotcha moment to point out that they, they made a mistake or if they commit commit a fallacy and you just play name that fallacy. Oh, that's the ad populum fallacy. Oh, that's the ad hominem fallacy. Oh, that, you know, it, and then you move on without sort of taking pains to explain why you think it's not a good argument and why generally speaking that wouldn't be a good argument and they could see that that's not a good argument. You know, then over the course of many conversations you can sort of erode certain ways of arguing and you can sort of meet um, and, and, and have a meeting of minds, which doesn't have to mean agreement. It can just mean we understand one another's position. I and like meeting of minds. I like it a lot. Sounds yeah. Like yeah, like yeah. I wonder where I've heard that before. <laughs> um, well, I don't know if we. I don't know if we mean the same thing by meeting of minds. Like I, I, I I'm sort of uh, in a minority. When I say meeting of minds, I don't mean meeting in the middle or agreement. I just mean. I know what you mean, and you know what I mean. I know what your reasons are. You know what my reasons are. We don't have to come to any agree agreement about what we believe. As we don't have to have any shared beliefs uh, at the end, but it's really hard to hate people who you understand. It, but yeah. it's really easy to vilify and demonize and look down upon people whose views you don't understand that where they're just inscrutable to you and they just seem perverse. And that's why I think this is a problem we as atheists have. We have this tendency to assume that they're all just friggin' systematically irrational. Mm -hmm. I I hear all the time that these people. Are, are suffering a kind of madness, and yeah, I that's, think that's a mistake. You know, that's, that's, that's an insult. I, I don't get that. Yeah, but, uh, but I'm going to have to leave it at that um, because we're coming up on the 10 o'clock hour Eastern time here, which is the 9 o'clock hour Central time, and I would like to get some uh, last words in, and I'm going to start with you, Alex. Oh, I had so much to say. I had a two-parter and everything. Do you? But um, I'll I'll do one part. 
Uh, I'm just glad that uh, Ozzy mentioned a couple of things that um, it, when you're when you're talking to people who are passionate about things that they consider sacred, a lot of times it doesn't work. I mean, I've spoken to people who you know sworn that the crystals cured this or that. I mean, or the fact that I eat meat, and I responded, well, you know, I think this and this and this about you know the meat industry or eating meat, and people automatically went the the serial killer route with me. Um, yeah, the um, <laughs> my dad's a cop, and ki people who enjoy the suffering of animals, you know, are more inclined to be serial killers. And I'm like, wow, that's that's really, really uh, that's that's I think what atheists do sometimes to um, believers, or the other way around. Uh, um, but I think the more important thing, and specifically to the cult of honesty, is um, the hangouts. I think are the most important. Thing. Because we too tend to project our own tone and our own voice to the conversations that we read and, and, and how we interact with people. You know, it says more about us the way we're reading it and the way we respond than maybe the intents of another person. That's why I think the hangouts are better because you can gauge their tone a little bit better. I mean, I could say to somebody, somebody could say, you know, that's a great, can give me a backhanded compliment and just put a winky face at the end and, and, and that the tone of it is completely wrong. Um, or I could say something and be very monotonous about it and people can, you know, like, oh, this guy's such a jerk or he's, you know, being rude or, or crass or whatever. So I think taking the time to get to know people um, on in hangouts like this or in a casual format just so that we can have a better gauge on each other, I think that that works well. And I'm glad that we do the hangouts and maybe we could do it twice a week. Maybe on... Mm -hmm. that, that, that would be something interesting um, as well, or maybe a different format. I don't know. But uh, it's nice to have these so that we can um, discuss while seeing a face. Um, sorry, Jonathan. But uh, <laughs> We can see his face. It's just a picture of his face. Yeah, well, even hearing the voice, the, hearing the voice is, is uh, very helpful. How do, you, um, how do you know? I could just be being like very, very still right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's practicing his mime. <laughs> I was supposed to say, like, I can't see your eyes and without the video, and then I see your picture and you're wearing glasses, <laughs> and I still can't see your eyes. So. Um, I'm not the Unabomber. <laughs> your lips aren't moving, you know. You must be a ventriloquist, too. <laughs> <laughs> or a psychic. Famous last words. I'm not the Unabomber. All right, did you have anything else to add, uh, Alex? No, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. And Jonathan, you're next on the Price is Right. Oh, well, uh, when it comes to the matter of faith and you're in a, a, a discussion with somebody, um, we were talking before about how to engage somebody in a conversation like that and, 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 and how to go about it, but sometimes you don't have, well, you never have control over how the other person is going to respond and, and uh, conduct themselves in that conversation. Uh, I've been involved in conversations before where it was a blatant trap and you just, it, it doesn't matter how you respond and how you hold yourself, uh, the, the way that conversation is going to go is just the way it's going to go and it's not going to be a pleasant experience for you. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't know, I, I can't really say uh, enough good things about uh, uh, the, the New Covenant group. I, I think it's uh, what I've seen of it so far. Uh, is has been has been great and mind changing for 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 me and I I hope you guys succeed at, at getting the word out. Great, thank you very much, Jonathan. We're moving on to you now, Ozzy. Um, well, let me echo what uh, Alex said about uh, the the benefits of these uh, these hangouts. What a difference it makes to be able to have this this kind of dialogue with uh, with people face to face. Um, uh, it makes a tremendous difference. Uh, having had so many discussions in type mediums where there was a lot of anonymity uh, and distance, people really feel free to uh, to say quite nasty things uh, because they lose all of the natural inhibitory mechanisms that come with face-to-face -face, uh, discussions. Um, but I gotta say I'm not actually very sanguine about uh, interfaith dialogue or dialogue between people of faith and people not of faith um, or the religious and the irreligious. Uh, I've never been very sanguine about that. In fact, I've, I've put it down in the past. Um, 
just because it, I didn't see it as going anywhere and to, because it, I've always seen people who who did this they were always sort of the mildest people they were always the people um, who were already the most accommodating and moderate in their views and and willing to have their minds changed so that I, I really never saw um, the the an opportunity for the people that we think who are most strident at both ends of any spectrum to come together and these are the people that we want to sort of you know see things a little differently and, and understand people uh, but I'm hoping maybe this will uh, this new covenant group and and the new technology that we have available to us will bring people together who otherwise would just stare clear of each other uh, but I'd like to see a, a lot more strident voices here um, not because I, I, I just like conflict but because I think those are the people that we've got to get to and the people that, that need to get to us. Well said, well said. Um, Alex, do you want to say a little prayer to end the show? No, my sprinklers will go off when I burst into flames. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was, hoping I, was, I was hoping I would be able to smooth that over. Amen, indeed. All right, well, that'll be the end of the show then. Uh, I think I actually timed this perfectly. It is at 9.59, oh, 10 o'clock, bingo. And so I'm going to get the broadcast stopping. Thank everybody. I would like to thank everybody for taking time out to uh, come to the Hangout. For everybody who is watching, thank you very much for watching, whether it be on the YouTube platform or on the Ustream platform. We will see you all next week. Bye-bye.